People come to campus, in part, perhaps, to become leaders. What does it mean to be a leader? Well, a leader, I suppose, is something like someone who's impatient with inherited ideologies, however comfortable or rewarding they might be for you to parade around showing them. Welcome to HXA Conference 2022. We are here. You made it. We are doing this thing. Yeah. All right. All right. I am Kyle Vitale. For those of you who don't know me, I'm director of programs here at HXA, and I'm so thrilled to be officially kicking off this gathering, which has been long in the making through years of COVID and social change and so much else. Three years on since our last conference in New York finds our organization bigger and bolder which is good because it needs to match the bigger and bolder challenges we all face on campus and off. We're looking forward to several days of digging in together to unearth new solutions and refine existing practices as this cultural title change in higher ed continues. So to get right to it, I'm pleased to introduce tonight's opening keynote speakers. Jonathan Haidt and John Tomasi will each spend some time discussing issues facing society and higher ed and dialogue about HXA's impact for the future. We'll then turn to our Open Inquiry Awards, where we'll honor some exciting individuals doing critically important work for the future of higher ed. So, Jonathan Haidt is a social psychologist at New York University's Stern School of Business and the co-founder and board chair of Heterodox Academy. His research examines the intuitive foundations of morality and how morality varies across cultures, including the cultures of progressives, conservatives, and libertarians. He is the author of the New York Times bestsellers, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion, and The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure, co-authored with Greg Lukianoff. And John Tomasi is the inaugural president of Heterodox Academy, coming from Brown University, where he was the Romeo Elton 1843 professor of natural theology and taught and wrote about political theory and public policy. At Brown, he was twice awarded university prizes for excellence in undergraduate teaching. His latest book, Free Market Fairness, draws simultaneously on moral insights from defenders of economic liberty, such as F.A. Hayek, and advocates of social justice, such as John Rawls, to offer a new theory of liberal justice committed to both limited government and the material betterment of the poor. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to Johns for being here. And John, I yield the floor to you. All right, well, thank you so much, Kyle. Um, it is so good to be together. Um, I've been to a couple events. I was in the bar last night, and there's just a feeling like coming out of a bunker after a nuclear war or something. Okay, that's a little, little overstated, but a kind of a sociological nuclear war or something like that. Um, and you know, talking with people, I, I, I sat tonight at dinner, I sat at a table of new members, people that this is their first HXA event, and everyone had an amazing story. Um, everyone had a story about how they were going about their business, they were doing their professional duty, and then something weird happened, something that derailed their career, perhaps. And you couldn't tell if people were on the right or the left, because it wasn't about that. It was about being a good scholar or a good teacher, and then boom, something happens. So um, actually, my, my sense is that as we're coming out of the bunker, like everyone wants to talk. Everyone wants to talk to other people. Nobody wants to feel they're walking on eggshells. And I sense there's a real energy here that people can really just talk. And so I'm gonna just suggest, um, if that's the way everyone is at this conference, just go up to anybody and just say, so what's your story? And everyone has a story. And I want everybody to talk to everybody. And because you know, we need that. We've been kind of deprived of this uh, for years. Um, so uh, welcome, let's have fun. Um, now, um, all right, so I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about kind of the big picture. I'll, I'll try to tell you some, some ways of thinking about what's happening that might be, might be novel. And then I'll pass it off to John, who will tell you more about what his, his plan is for Heterodox Academy. So I want to start off uh, my talk the way I'm starting off all of my talks these days, especially when I talk to undergrads, which is I start by asking, what's the most fundamental question in life? Just think about it for a moment. What's the most fundamental question in life? Just call it out. What do you think it is? How should we live? Hope. Who are you? 
What's the meaning? Okay, so these are great questions. <laughs> but not a one of them is fundamental because fundamental means the fundament, the basis, the foundation upon which everything else is built. And I submit to you that there's only one fundamental question in life, and that is approach or avoid. What I mean by that is, as soon as life got the ability to move, as soon as one-celled organisms could move, most of the rest of evolution is which way and how fast and what do you do once you get there. And the evolution of the brain is almost entirely a commentary on that question, approach or avoid. All of our sense organs, the, the brain builds up and up and up so that you have more channels of information to optimize the question of approach or avoid. And the human brain is so gigantic it has a, an entire patch of cortex. The front left cortex is called the behavioral activation system. It's specialized for approach. It's, when, when that's active, we, we, we are focused on, on, on opportunities and on getting opportunities. The front right cortex is called the behavioral inhibition system. It, it does threat, it does withdrawal, disgust, and fear. And so the human brain is organized so that either we're in discover mode or we're in defend mode. We can't be in both at the same time. Discover mode or defend mode. Um, in discover mode, it's like, it's like you're a kid in a candy shop. It's like there's all these possibilities. And the motto, the way that a student is who comes to college in discover mode is, whoever grows the most by graduation wins. It's all about growth. Defend mode is very different. Defend mode is everything is a threat. Everything is a potential threat. Look out, look out. In defend mode, you cling to your team. And the motto turns out to be, uh, if we defeat them, we win. Now, this is a terrible mindset to bring to college. So now I'd like to give you a very, very brief history of the academy told through the lens of discover versus defend mode. Here's how it goes. So the word academy comes to us. It's a Greek word. It's the name of a grove of olive trees outside of Athens, and that's where Plato and Socrates and these other philosophers would hang out and they would talk in the academy. Um, and if you've ever read any of Plato's dialogues, you know that these people were in discover mode. There was deep intellectual seriousness, there was brilliance, there was drinking, there was ribald humor, there were jokes, there were pranks, um, um, <clears throat> and there was laughter and there were epiphanies. And this is the way college felt to me. I, I majored in philosophy at Yale, uh, and this is what it was like. I was fantastic being an undergraduate in the, 19, in the 1980s. Um, it was a garden of delights. It was a garden of social and intellectual delights. Um, now, um, American universities in the 20th century, we dominate the list of the world's top universities because we developed this incredible institution that leveraged an institutional structure and a psychological state, discover mode, in the service of a, tel a telos or mission, which was truth. And that virtuous triangle made American universities the best in the world. Um, so I have a question for those of you. So first, how many of you in this room graduated from college before 2010? Just raise your hand high if that's you. So that's most of you, okay. Um, now my question is, how many of you remember things as I do? That is, you, college, it was more like a garden of delights than it was walking on eggshells. Raise your hand if it was more of a garden of delights. Okay, and now raise your hand, those of you, if it was more like eggshells. You were always walking on eggshells. Okay, and there were a few, there were a few. Some of those, you know, some colleges were terrible. Some people had, you know, I, I don't want to get into that. Anyway. <laughs> okay, my point is that universities only make sense from the point of view of discover mode. Um, Amanda Ripley, uh, so, so one of the exciting things about working now is that there are all these allied industries, and I'm finding that journalism and law are so similar to scholarship in the academy, because we all understand the, it, it's absolutely essential to get conflicting views. You have to seek out both sides. We have an adversarial legal system. So Amanda Ripley, this wonderful journalist, in this incredible essay called Complicating the Narrative, I urge you all to look it up, Complicating the Narrative. She writes, it's impossible to feel curious while also feeling threatened. 
In this hypervigilant state, we feel an involuntary need to defend our side and attack the other. That anxiety renders us immune to new information. So think about that. Imagine a college in which most of the students, or even a quarter of them, were immune to new information. You simply can't do education when students are in defend mode. And this is what hit us on campus in 2014. This is what Greg Lukianoff saw. He was the first to identify it. Working for FIRE, he could see suddenly a lot of students were seeing Shakespeare and Greek mythology as threatening and, need, and asking for protection from it. Um, and so at first it was just colleges, but now we've seen it in almost every industry, certainly every creative industry in media, journalism, tech, law. Um, so it's hitting all of our institutions now, um, and it's making it very difficult for institutions to achieve their mission, their purpose, their telos. So now I want to ask, how many in this room graduated from college in 2017 or later or are currently still undergrads? Raise your hand if you're if you're in that, okay, so we have a bunch of, of young people here, great. So just for those of you, raise your hand if your experience of college was more like a garden of earthly, a garden of curiosity versus walking on eggshells. Raise your hand for garden of curiosity. One, we don't, okay, so we do have some. Okay, and we have em, Emma here saying sometimes, sort of, parts of it. And raise your hand, this, just the young folks, uh, if, if it was more like walking on eggshells. There was a lot of walking on eggshells. Okay, so by chi-square test, this is definitely a significant difference. <laughs> Okay, um, so this is our mission at Heterodox Academy. We must make universities, once again, be communities characterized by discover mode, not defend mode. Now, how do we do that? Um, so first, it's essential that we understand what's happening because it's incredibly complicated, subtle, and fascinating. And here I wanna bring in uh, the research I'm doing now <clears throat> Um, on the effects of social media on every aspect of human relationships and institutions. <clears throat> so as some of you know, I recently wrote an article in The Atlantic um, called Life After Babel, um, although they A-B tested titles and they picked uh, why the past 10 years of American life have been uniquely stupid. Uh, and you know, it worked, like they, they're very good at picking titles. Um, so the key idea, the key metaphor um, is that our world now, that social media has essentially knocked over the modern Tower of Babel, and the key line in that story from the Bible is God is, is angry at the humans and their hubris, and he says, let us go down and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another. So social media, I argue, has shredded any possibility of widely shared meaning uh, and put us all in shards, broken shards. It's very difficult to communicate across these shards of meaning. Um, but I, I went a lot further. As a social psychologist, I was trying to understand how social media changed our relationships to each other. Um, and my argument is that social media platforms, especially Twitter, but also Facebook and others, um, it, was, is, it made us structurally stupid. So nobody is stupid. No person is stupid. I'm not saying that. I'm saying when you put people into groups, um, the genius of groups when they're properly constituted is that we all suffer from confirmation bias and the only cure is other people who share a different confirmation bias. That's the only known way to get around it. And so a smart institution is well constituted so people challenge each other. They call attention to studies that, you, that the other person couldn't find. Um, and when that stops, the organization, the group, gets structurally stupid. Um, now, it's as, though, uh, it's as though Facebook and Twitter passed out a billion dart guns, and most of us don't want to shoot anybody. You can attack anyone anonymously, any time of the day or night. Most of us don't want to do that. Um, but it's widely used by people on the far right and the far left, also trolls, Russian intelligence agents. But for our purposes, what's affecting universities is that people on the far right and the far left love shooting. They get paid by the dart, and who do they shoot? You can't, if you're on the far right, you can't really attack someone on the far left, like who cares? What you do is you shoot the moderates on your own side. You shoot the dissenters and you shoot the leaders. That's who's been getting most of the darts. And when that happens, people go quiet or people become, they feel intimidated. Um, so let me, um, so Socrates was the gadfly of Athens and his goal was to question people's lazy beliefs and spur them to deeper thinking. Um, 
But beginning around 2015, if you try to be the gadfly of your university or of your field, what's going to happen? You're going to get shot full of darts. You're going to get shamed, canceled, and perhaps even fired within a week. And that was not possible before Twitter. Um, so um, let's see. Um, so um, I make the argument that um, when institutions began uh, when people began using Twitter and other things to intimidate others, it was as, as though they were shooting darts into, the, into the, their own brain, the brain of the organization. Um, so this is our mission at Heterodox Academy. We are the answer to the Babel problem. Um, here's our mission statement. We are committed to enhancing the quality of research and education by promoting open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, and constructive disagreement in institutions of higher learning. We are the cure for structural stupidity. So how do we move forward? What do we do in this crazy uh, polarized world? Well, that depends on our mental model of the situation. Um, many academics uh, like me were greatly influenced by George Lakoff's book, Metaphors We Live By. We learned that we can't understand anything complicated in the world unless we have a mental model. We usually draw it from our embodied experience. And they talked about how argument is war. We use the metaphor of like a debate and argument, like, you know, I blocked his approach, he tried to defend. So we think about argument in terms of war, and we think about political conflict in terms of war. We're in a culture war. But if you have the wrong metaphor, you can't think right. And in a real war, you can literally kill your enemy until they're dead, and then you win, you take their territory. That can't happen in a culture war, because the harder you hit them, the stronger they get. So what do you do? Um, instead of seeing this as a war, I think we need to see this as a complex dynamical system. It's an abstract concept. Some of you, uh, we have some systems theorists here. Um, so some systems are like a clock, and oh, there's the gear that's broken. Let's fix that gear. Other systems are like a cloud or the economy. They're complex dynamical systems. You can't just change something but you can raise the temperature or lower it. You can change parameters, and they have profound effects on the system. Here are some parameter changes that caused the problem. These are the ones Greg and I wrote about in the coddling. Rising political polarization, rising rates of depression and anxiety, rising overprotection of children, a gigantic increase in administrators, especially DEI administrators, uh, new ideas about social justice focused on equality of outcomes, not opportunities. These are the parameter changes that came in in the 2010s and radically changed the complex dynamical system of a university. So if that's what caused the problem, what's the solution? It's not a war. It's not a campaign to fight a war. It's careful planning to change the key parameters. We have to change those parameters uh, in our country. Things like we've got to give kids childhood back. We've got to have them have conflicts unsupervised so they learn to work things out before they come to college and insist on having a dean to literally place a no contact order on their roommate. I have seen this happen. A no contact order because I can't stand her or whatever it is. They need to learn to work it out before they come to college. Um, and this is what we're doing at Heterodox Academy. Um, uh, we are working on, for example, at HXA, we've had so many great um, ideas, so much great content about new approaches to DEI. We need to be inclusive, but within our community, we have so much great writing, so many people. I think Maria Dixon Hall is here. She spoke at our last conference. Uh, we had Chloe Valdery here. Um, we have all these ideas about how to do these things in a humane and humanistic way that draws on our common humanity. Um, so um, to begin to wrap up here, I want to, uh, I want to suggest this. Um, anything we can do that puts people into discover mode will help us regain the universities that we need and want. Uh, and that's what this conference is all about. What's, our, what's our, our theme? It's renewing spaces of knowledge and trust. This conference is about giving you the skills, all of us talking, sharing ideas, about how to create zones of discover mode in our lives and in our universities. And I urge all of you to keep this distinction in mind, discover mode versus defend mode, and ask yourself these three questions always. One. How can I keep myself in discover mode? Two, how can I keep my students in discover mode? And three, what can we do together to keep our universities in discover mode? And that's my transition to introducing John Tomasi.
Um, John is always in discover mode. Um, John is a true intellectual who just is lost in a world of ideas. Um, I sometimes have used the word dreamy to describe him because you, when you get him going, like you get him talking, and he kind of looks up you know, at, at Plato's forms or something, and, and he just spins these webs of beautiful ideas. And his theme is curiosity, and it really calls us back to what we remember and love um, about college. Uh, and uh, uh, John doesn't do culture wars. He's not even on Twitter. Some would say he doesn't exist, but I... Um, uh, and John has been building. That's the thing about Discover Mode. That's where you build. Uh, and John has been building since 2005. He's been building an institution at Brown. He's been bringing viewpoint diversity to undergrads. And that's why he was such an incredible candidate for the job of presidency of HXA. And so I'll close with a vow that John and I made last night. We had a nice steak dinner at Elway's uh, last night. And over dinner, we were talking about this. And I said, John, can we make a vow to, to the audience tomorrow? And we talked about this. And I said, and we agreed on this. Here's our vow. Um, with your help, we will make the Academy fun again. Thank you, and welcome John Tomasi. Hi. So it's true that we went to Elway's restaurant last night, but I have to tell you that on the way over there, John mentioned that he thought it was Roger Elway's restaurant. <laughs> um, so, I, I'm, as, so as John said, um, I taught at Brown for many years. And I love Brown. It was been, it, it'll probably always be one of the great highlights of my life, one of the joys of of my career that I was able to spend so many years teaching at Brown. And yet I'm aware that Brown, that Brown has a certain, a certain reputation. And I do not want to disappoint you. So I'm going to begin with a quotation from Karl Marx. <laughs> so allow me, to, allow me to remind you of the opening lines of Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto, slightly adapted. Let me see if I can remember. A specter is haunting academia. The specter of independent thinking. All the powers of the existing intellectual monoculture, presidents and deans, the new czars of exclusion and cancellation, and the designers of days for freshman orientation <laughs> have, entered in, have entered into a holy alliance to exercise the specter of independent thinking. And yet still, this specter rises. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I promise not to start with that because, because I didn't want to be snarky. So now I'm going to do something less snarky and a little more serious. I want to tell you about an experience or rather a conversation that I had 18 years ago with some students at Brown. It's a conversation that changed my life. It's the conversation that I think, strangely enough, led me to be here on the stage with, with, with my friend John and with all of you. And what happened to me was this. Um, one day, a day like any other day, I walked back to my office at Brown, and there were two students there waiting for me. But they were a most unlikely combination of students. They are juniors at this point. I'd known them since their first semester of their freshman years. But they are juniors now, and they had risen from their awkward freshman phase to become two of the most recognizable figures on the Brown campus. One of them was this very tall person who I actually vividly remember first noticing when I was giving my first lecture his freshman year in the fall, a, big, a large class of 500 students on introduction to political philosophy. 
And it's a class in which I was usually talking about Socrates. What I was doing there, as I often do, is trying to problematize people's narratives. So I was talking about how we think Socrates is, is a hero, but the Athenians, those who know him best, hated him so much they wanted him dead. What was that all about? And as I was giving this lecture going on, I was like looking at, as you guys all know, as you professors all know, I'm giving the lecture, I'm looking out in the audience, and I happened to spot this kid in the back who was really, really tall, huge eyes, and the worst haircut I'd ever seen in my life. It's kind of, and I thought to myself as I was talking, that kid's gonna have a really tough time in the dorms you know, at Brown. It turned out that in fact, he had no hard, hard times at all. He was a brilliant kid. He was actually a supermodel. He would actually go out to places and wear clothes. And if they liked the way he wore the clothes, they would pay him money to stay the next day and wear them publicly and they'd pay him money. And the haircut, which I thought was done by his mom or him with a bowl, was actually done by someone with a first name. <laughs> so that was one of these students who was waiting for me. And the other one was a person who was not a supermodel. Um, and he was, in many ways, one of the least popular people on campus because Rob, the one, Rob, the first student, was, had, had, had an opinion column in the Brown Daily Herald in which he defended, in brilliant, in brilliant novel ways, the, the platform of, of the Democratic Party. So he would write, Rob would write, would write these wonderful essays on a regular basis from his column about the Democratic point of view. And his colleague, this person he was waiting, waiting for at my office, Stephen, um, the, un the less popular one, though with a better haircut in my opinion, but anyways, the less popular one. Um, he was the campus conservative. And so he was writing essays on a regular basis with great bravery, great sincerity, and intelligence to equal that of Rob's, defending the mainstream platform of the Republican Party. So he'd write the essay about why gay marriage was wrong. This was 18 years ago. He'd write the essay about why premarital sex was wrong. I mean, you know, again, trying to get dates on a Friday night, whatever. He so he was a very unpopular figure. And to have them both, to find them both, to find both these students together outside my door was very strange. And some of you know, at Brown, there's no core curriculum. There's nothing required at all. Students can find their own way and take the courses that, that they like. But what's more at Brown, if there's a course you think should be taught that's not being taught, you can, if you like, devise your own syllabus, find some professor to sponsor it, and take the course for a grade. And now here's the important part. These two students, these two unlikely students, have been quietly meeting off campus for several weeks to design a new course that they want to see taught at Brown. And they came to me with a syllabus, and this, and this course was called, some, the course was called Knowing Right, Conservative Thought in America. And their idea was that they had not had a chance at Brown to take courses that can help them understand why any intelligent person could be a Republican. <laughs> and each of them, for their own very different reasons, because they were both very politically committed, they, had, they wanted to learn more about this before, before they left Brown. And here's the key thing they said to me. They said to me, it was Rob actually who said it, he said to me, I didn't come to campus merely to become a more skillful defender of some inherited ideology. This is a, a statement from probably the most popular student on the Brown campus. This is a statement from a person who, a year later, would apply to law schools, you know, I was supporting writing letters and stuff, to apply, to apply to law schools, who got into Harvard and Yale and Stanford and all the rest, and turned them all down to go to law school at Iowa, because he wanted to launch his political career there. And I say to people at Brown, the really smart kids go to Harvard and Yale, but the killers go to places like Iowa. So they had reasons. So they had reasons. They had reasons to take this course for, for, their, own, for their own growth. But that statement, right, that statement coming from that particular student, we didn't come to campus merely to become more skillful defenders of some inherited ideology. It stayed with me, and it stays with me now. Because that question, that statement, leads to a question worth pondering. Well, why do you come to camp? What, why did you come to campus? What did you come to this place to do? What did you come to this place to become? And talking about it with them and the future gen generations of students who got me thinking about these topics, you know, one answer that we came up with was, was that people come to campus, in part, perhaps, to become leaders. 
What does it mean to be a leader? Well, a leader, I suppose, is something like someone who's impatient with inherited ideologies, however comfortable or rewarding they might be for you to parade around showing them. A, a leader is someone, more specifically, I think, who is insistent, maybe dispositionally, dispositionally insistent, on attempting to build bridges where chasms exist. But to build a bridge where chasms exist requires that you actually travel to the other side, investigate the ground there, see what it's actually like, so that the footings you put in will hold and will be secure. But think now more about that. So leadership in that sense could be interpreted as a political kind of leadership. And as I mentioned, these two students had political ambitions. One went on to Iowa, and he's now the state controller of Iowa, soon to run for governor. The other took a job at the Manchester Union Leader, writing opinions columns, um, you know, as you can imagine. Um, they, they, that, that idea about leadership is not just about organizing political groups. I think it's a way of life. It's leadership about that, that idea about building chasms, sorry, building bridges where chasms exist, is something that we do individually in our lives with people around us, if you choose to be. If you follow the HXA way, and we take those virtues seriously, then leadership, to be a leader, means being a certain way in the world with your friends, with your family, with your neighbors, with your people in your places of work. It means looking for ways where there are, looking for places where there are chasms and trying to think about ways to build bridges across those chasms with other people. It's not just a political concept, leadership in this sense, it's a fundamental human concept. And it's one of the concepts that I think lies at the base of HXA. I'm gonna go fast forward now to a year ago. How much time do I have? I'm very bad at timing these things. I have five minutes? Wow. <laughs> Just start, just a second. Oh, sorry. Um, so, fast forwarding now to you. One year ago, <laughs> people from Head Rocks Academy approached me with an opportunity. And they said, you know, would you be interested in, in um, leaving your job that you love at a university that you love? I mean, I say I love Brown, and I do love Brown, but there are days when I hate Brown, and I do hate Brown. <laughs> and there are days when Brown loves me, and there are days when Brown hates me. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated relationship. But it's a place that I love. And friends asked me, when I told them I wanted to, I really was hoping I would get this job because I wanted to do this job, they asked me, well, why would you want to do this job? And the answer may surprise you. The answer, sincerely, was because of you. The, your 500 people, you represent the 5,000, with the 5,000 members of Heterodox Academy. What interested me about this job was you. I actually like to think of you as the 500. It has kind of like a, a Spartan thing about it. <laughs> I had, I had a, um, there was a movie, the 300, and, and I remember my sister had some video where she was like doing sit-ups all the time to, anyway. <laughs> but, but, but quite seriously, I think of you, the 500, as rep representing all the HXA members, the 5,000. And my thought was, 5,000 people. And I've been sitting in on Zoom calls, checking out some of the communities, listening to the conversations, and I was consistently blown away by the talent, by the sincerity, by the intensity of people in this community. And I thought to myself, well, why not give it a go? Why not see if I could join them? And maybe by joining them, find some ways to activate the 5,000 so that we could do more than we've previously been doing and we can expand dramatically. I should add that, what do you think about the 5,000? I mean, I know the board at HXA is very proud that we had 5,000 members. Um, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty big number. Um, but if you think about it in terms of some other bigger numbers, for example, there are um, 500,000 tenure or tenure track professors in the US. That, by the way, makes you the 1%. <laughs> there are also, there are also, I'm told, um, along with there being 5,000 of you, there are about 5,000 
colleges and universities in the, in the US. Doing the math, which I'm not good at, but I can do this one, that's like one of you for every college and university. How do you feel about the prospect of being Atlas, each of you with one university, holding it up for the HXA way and trying to make it this amazing thing? I don't know, maybe you can do that. Um, but so there, uh, this is actually a serious point that I'm gonna come back to in my closing remarks at the end of the conference. We need to, bring up, we need to build our numbers. And I'll be saying more about to you um, very soon. But the important thing I wanted to say are these. Um, I'm, as, as president, I'm excited. I, chose the, I took the job because of you, because of the 5,000, because of the potential that I see that you represent. And my fundamental idea so far for HXA and where I want us to go is I want to focus on membership and I want, I want to change the experience of membership. Of, I want to change the experience of membership from an individual experience to a membership experience, to a, a collective experience, to a group experience. I want to move. I want to move our focus on changing hearts and minds, which will always be part of the HXA mission. I want to move that and, and grow that and develop that into an attempt to change institutions as well. I want to activate membership give you tools and new resources to actually start changing campuses to make our values more likely to survive there and not just, to, not just survive, but to triumph over time. And along with that, um, as you know, there are 26, there are currently, many of you know, there's 26 um, virtual communities. Um, it's not public yet, but in the January newsletter, we're gonna be announcing a major new initiative, a new private portal run by HXA exclusive for HXA members. It's gonna supercharge the ability of community, existing community members to communicate with each other, but it's also gonna be a way for every member of HXA to reach out and find fellowship and community with other HSA, HSA members in a secure private portal. Along with that, and far beyond that, HXA is soon gonna be, soon going to be announcing, maybe I'm announcing it right now, <laughs> HXA is soon gonna be announcing um, what I'm calling HXA campus communities. So fellowship that you feel individually, the enhanced fellowship you'll start to feel through the, the new, our new portal will be secondary, I think, to the possibility of the fellowship you'll start feeling when you start combining with fellow HXA members on your campus. There are currently, two, there are currently 20 campuses with more than 25 members. There are 50 campuses in the US with 15 or more members. There are 100 campuses right now in the US with more than 10 members. Within five years, I hope there to be an HXA campus community on every one of those 100 campuses. And in 10 years, perhaps, far more than that. Um, along, with that along with those communities, those, those campus communities will be announcing a suite of benefits, speakers, um, opportunities for retreats, just with you and your groups. Um, lots of different things will be extending to the communities. Um, we'll be piloting campuses this coming year. We're gonna be picking five to 10 um, existing uh, campus groups, sorry, five or 10 campuses to, to choose to create communities on those campuses. And an application for that process will become available in the fall semester. So I want you to start thinking about this now. Think about your campus, think about your experience, and I want you to be aware that come the fall, you're gonna see an opportunity to create a campus, a campus community of your own on your campus. Thank you. Thank you.